Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind the scenes tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your host, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Firm. I'm just Alex Regular Man Gore here with Lance Regular Man Psycho. No nicknames today. No nicknames. Uh, that green looks good on you. Matches it complements. If you're watching on the YouTube, Al's wearing a nice green polo today, and it complements his beautiful red-ish beard. Ish. Yeah, Santa Man. I feel I, like it's getting less red the longer it grows, though. It might be. Yeah, it might be. Um, speaking of red, flames are red, and they come out of rocket ships. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there, sure. And a metaphorical rocket ship for your skills is RevitRocketShip.com. Yeah. Go check that out. <clears throat> thousands of professionals, thousands of students, and a bunch of people at our firm have used this to up their skills, understand how building relates to the uh, drawings that you make. It makes you faster, more productive, and gives you a bunch of resources for you and your team, RevitRocketShip.com. You know what else is known for being red? Arcat. Arcat is known for being red, and they can help you go green. That's right. Arcat provides thousands of lead reports from building product manufacturers on how their products can help you make the green choice that's right for your project. Head over to arcat.com and find the information you need for lead. Check those guys out uh, today. I also want you to check out Pella Luxury. If you have that special house or that special building that you're designing for somebody, or even building, you need to check out Pella Luxury. You have never experienced a brand like this before. The collection of brands within the luxury division of Pella are the conversation starters, the pioneers of industry who provide window and door solutions to discerning architects, the building industry, and beyond. They have decades of experience creating things no one else in the world is creating, and the collection of brands are brought together to complement and build on one another. They don't push beyond the limits. They set them. Explore PellaLuxury.com forward slash the firm today. Back to me. <laughs> Go, Lance, go. Once again, I highly recommend if you are in our industry, even if you're not and you're just a homeowner, I would subscribe to the NAHB, National Association of Home Builders. They are not a sponsor. I just think they have such good information to their email list because there's at least one article a week that I that comes across my email and I just really appreciate. And today that is their take on the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. So um, the title is House Passes Flawed Inflation Reduction Act. The House today, and this was a while back, obviously, last week, approved the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 legislation that NAHB opposes because it fails to ease inflationary pressures on housing and contains troublesome new building and energy code requirements. That could, surprise Al, yeah. raise the cost of housing for new home owners and renters uh so okay wait why does how can it how is it gonna do that yeah that's exactly that's exactly what i'm gonna get into right so quote um from uh let's see here uh nahb the legislation does nothing to address the housing supply crisis facing <laughs> facing american families the letter to lawmakers said Rather, the, the bill will disincentivize, disincentivize multifamily construction, which is absolutely critical to solving the housing crisis, uh, increase the cost of new homes through higher energy code requirements, and inflate labor costs. Uh, I, I am baffled, but then unbaffled because I realize how the government works. So in this Inflation Reduction Act, they put code requirements? Yeah, and here they are. Perfect. Oh, great, because that... <sighs> okay, so so here's the here's they are, and, and this is why it's relevant because there's architects, everybody who's most people who are listening to this particular uh, Friday episode of Inside the Firm, obviously you know you're an architect, you're a designer, you're a constructor, something like that, right? Maybe you're a developer. Uh, so on the codes front from the article, the legislation contains one billion in grants to pressure state and local governments to adopt more stringent energy code regulations. Yes. The, Got the, it. The practical effect will be to raise housing costs even further while doing very little to provide meaningful savings savings for residential homes and apartments. 
two-thirds of the funds, or $670 million, will be made available for the adoption of energy regulations for residential and commercial buildings to meet zero energy provisions in the 2021 edition of the International Energy Conservation Code, IECC for short. These zero energy targets are not appropriate for most jurisdictions and not cost-effective for consumers. So that's the, that's the big one, right? is uh, that's how you know they see this going down and that it really doesn't do help at all. It doesn't. Um, because at, at, again, at a certain point, these, these, these codes and uh, these codes just get overwhelming. And if you're trying to do things as most cost effective as possible, but you have all of these regulations thrown at you, you have this dichotomy going on. And it's not a good situation. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Um, okay. So I want to at least touch base on that because we haven't even talked about that Inflation Reduction Act, and I thought it was perfectly pertinent. Um, the other thing is I want to give a sneak peek. I had a gentleman uh, on the show, the Monday Morning Coffee Show, and his episode will probably air in about a month or two. Um, it's just <laughs> we're just kind of backed up with everything. But his name is Joe Rocky, and he is a – let me pull it up real quick. He is – if it'll if my Word document will work today. It won't. He's a uh, developer and a real estate investor – and a house flipper, and now basically a landlord. And what he does is uh, he buys properties, and then he does the rent a rent to own situation for them. Mm. So this is a guy who is bullish on real estate from an investment standpoint, and that's why his opinion to me holds a lot more weight than somebody who has no skin in the game and is wanting to get in their skin in the game due to a housing crash. You see what I'm saying? Like people that, and those people are the people on. LARPing on the sidelines who are like, oh, this, I, all I see is prices go up. So eventually you got, you know, there's going to be a big crash and that's when I'm going to buy a house and stuff like that. So, um, what, what he's getting at with this is, uh, I'm going to pull it up here. I, it's about a seven minute segment that we're going to listen to. And I thought it was so interesting. His perspective was a perspective of, uh, that I haven't heard because I forgot about this one critical item, and that is the the moratoriums on evictions are are sunsetting and expiring. I don't even think you remember this. My wife didn't either, and then I, then I had to go in up. It was so non believable to me because I thought Has, that was like a year ago. Like we've already went through that. Is that still a thing? I found two articles to back it up that literally came out exactly in the state. Like this guy, this is on the ground sort of information yep. very timely so here we go here's joe rocky and his uh his rant on um where he thinks the economy is headed and, and truly where a crash could happen so tell us uh, in in your world you know how, how do you see right now you know the government and the courts impacting real estate sort of where we're at right now and then the second question is affordable housing it's his, you know it's his buzzword it's this thing that needs to happen but uh -huh. in the city i operate in their idea is that they are going to start taxing people who are developers in order to in order to create uh, affordable housing. And I know the government does not create affordable housing. Like developers no. create affordable housing. So just what are your thoughts on that? Well, all right. So starting point, um, you cannot artificially just because you feel like it keep making things more expensive through your code law. So it. Code that has been since 1984 is just as safe in keeping your house from burning down to the same code that's being put in place now. But the difference is about 40x the cost. So in any company, regardless of who you're looking at, the person who pays all of the costs of the governmental fees, including taxes, is always the end user, period. Mm -hmm. Yep. There's no, that's an economical fact of life. So the more stupid fees you put on because some lobbyist paid you to use these arc fault circuit breakers rather than the exact same ones that always work regardless just means that your chance of having something be less expensive is not. I live in Pittsburgh. It is impossible to build a brand new property from scratch for less than $300,000 whenever it comes time to resell. Because we're not doing this out of the goodness of our hearts. We're not Habitat for Humanity. We're doing this for a profit so I can make sure all of my employees get paid and also I get paid as well. That's a fact of life. So if, if the government, which normally starts with an opposition to that fact, says that, that that's the problem that we're renovating things and making things better, no, that, that, that's not the problem. 
The problem is you're not letting us build things that are still safe. Like people think you have code 84. It's not going to be safe anymore. Yes, it is. Those houses are still standing. Yeah. Um, you know, go anywhere in this country. That's, that's a city that's relatively old, San Francisco, Pittsburgh, all the ones on the East coast. There are plenty of houses built before world war II that are doing just old fine. Um, and that's a bit major problem that you put all of these rules in effect that slow things down, that keep you from being able to build the so-called affordable housing. Um, the other factor is you can't pay people not to work that are capable of working because that diminishes the workforce within itself to be able to get people to, to go and do the jobs that no one wants to do, like digging the ditches or climbing on the roofs. So that in itself your program of the government paying people not to work is making things more expensive inherently. And I haven't even gotten to the courts yet. This is just from <laughs> in, in the mayor's office and in the county planning division. Mm -hmm. So the, the issue that that's going to come with the courts is the courts are going to make the recession that's coming up prolonged. So we already have right now the beginnings of experiencing of inflation today. We're, we're seeing that, that's part of why it's mostly the reason why gas costs so much nationwide. It's not because Putin went to war. It's because we decided to pay trillions of dollars to pay people not to work and keep them in fear. Agreed. That's what we did. And that's the ramifications that are happening now. What will happen over the course between this winter and this spring is the bottom end of real estate markets are going to fall through the face of the earth because inevitably eventually judges are going to wake up and say, we're have to evict people. We can't let them live for three years for free. Mm. And the more shut down your state is the harder it's going to be. The more shut down your city is the harder it's going to be. And people are going to disregard it at first because it's going to be in those neighborhoods that are crappy already. Why do I care if there's more vacant buildings? Well, here's why you should care. First off banks control our economy. No questions about it. And when banks stop getting paid, they get mad. And when they get mad, everything shuts down. Fact of life. So you have all these landlords that haven't been paid for year, year and a half, two years in Pennsylvania's case, three years in California's case, and probably going to be longer. And what, they're not fixing up their properties. You never get a property back after you evict someone that's awesome. It doesn't happen. <laughs> so it's going to be broken. And here's the, the, the major component. So in Pennsylvania, 40% of the tenants stopped paying the day they found out that they couldn't get kicked out. So for two years, 40% of the tenants stopped working. So to make easy math on myself, say you had five units, three of them kept paying, two of them didn't. Now you finally evict them two years later after all of this problem, not to mention you still have to keep paying the mortgages and the taxes throughout all of this. You then are walking into a property that is not livable and you don't have the capital to fix it because you probably barely stayed afloat with only three of your properties active. So what are you going to do? You're eventually going to have to just liquidate it, but you don't have as, as a current landlord, the capability or probably even desire to buy a new one. So for the four landlords that are left that want to keep being landlords, there's no desire to go buy your broken house now. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait some more. Because eventually that price, because of basic supply and demand economics, there will be a ton of supply, virtually no demand, because no bank's giving a loan anymore. No bank is giving a loan to a, a, a house in those types of areas. They just all failed. I'm not giving you another loan. So now we're done with cash buyers, even less demand as a result of less capability. And boom. Oh, well, we don't care. That's the bad parts of our neighborhood. We, we don't talk about those. Well, here's the, this other fact of that decision there, Mr. Politician, is that you just made a ton of people homeless mm -hmm. and there's nowhere to put them because there's no houses that are fixed. So for those landlords that actually went through and fixed up their properties, they have a ton of people who want to move in and only one house. Well, that's supply and demand in the other direction. They can charge whatever they want and be selective as they want for those tenants. And I know for myself, any single person that got evicted or any problem that implies evicted, 
that shows up on their court from the day COVID started and through 2022, that's on your record for 10 years in Pennsylvania, and you'll never be my tenant. Or anyone who's going to be in your house has that. So I'm not just shunning you. I'm kicking your entire family out and taking you off my list forever. Because that decade basically is forever. Okay. So what do, what do you think about... So so first of all, I, you know, the first thing I said is, like I was saying earlier, was... Is that true? Is there, are there are there still these eviction moratoriums? It doesn't seem right. So I looked up. We'll talk about the two articles. Yeah. But the big big thing I wanted to ask you besides that was, uh, or you mentioned that point was, is that when the fi- the liquid finally dries up? Because that's the problem every time. When we hit the last recession was, it wasn't so much that there wasn't this demand or the or the supply or anything like that. It was nobody could get a loan to do anything. Right. I think. <clears throat> I think that's like, I think that's one of the jabs. I think it's one of the combos in, in, in a punch combination okay. that, that puts you out. You know, like you probably actually saw this one. It, it was famous. Like Donald Cerrone did like the perfect like jab, jab, yes. hook, and then like kick. Yeah. And everyone was like. It was bam, bam, bam. Yep. Just like that. And then a kick and it, it was done. Yeah. So I don't know which part of this is. Like that might be the punch to the face. It might be the jab. I don't think it's going to be the, the, the kick. Um, but what I'm getting to, and, and actually before, f- before I add on to the combo, yeah. uh, sh- tell us about what are you bringing up? Okay. So I, so I, so I, so I went and looked up this morning if, if this was really happening because I just didn't believe it. Yep. Sure enough, literally August 18th, 2022, the same day I interviewed Joe, I found two articles this morning. And one is from public source or whatever. It's uh, and it's titled "Eviction Filings Surge as COVID Rent Relief Ends," and uh, and then under it, the landlord filing the most evictions in Allegheny County in July, which is in PA, which is where oh. he's from. So I was like, "Holy cow!" He's actually like, no, I'm not saying this guy's a liar. It's just it was just something that was not on the tip of my tongue, top of my head, all of that, right? Yep. Um, so basically. Evictions in from the article, evictions in the county have risen for three straight months. The local rise bucks a national trend of lower than average eviction filings touted by the federal government as a promise for a different future. Uh, instead of evictions spiking two, two, 200 or 300 percent of historical averages, as many predicted once the CDC moratorium ended, it has remarkably been 26 below historic averages in the full first 10 months since the moratorium ended. Right. And then um, one of the things they go on to say, so yeah, so this this guy who is uh, is a uh, a landlord, he says, goes on to say, um, there's a significant number of people who are behind on rent, and we can't do this forever. Just like Joe was saying, our operating budget can't stand it," said Rich Davidson, the chief financial officer for Allegheny County Housing Authority, where about 300 tenants in, uh, owe some measure of rent, but none currently face eviction. The current car- the county authority has about 3,000 units. Uh, quote, I, I've got 300000 in delinquent rent. 50% of my tenants are not paying. Ooh, 50%. <laughs> yeah. But, we, but um, evictions, he said evictions are not up in that quote that you read. Uh, go back. Let's go right back there. here. Instead of evic- evictions spiking to 300%, they're remarkably low. Yeah. Yeah. They, well, they still haven't because the courts haven't stepped in yet. And that's the second article. Gotcha. Yeah. So that's, and that's again what Joe was saying. Once the courts wake up. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, and, and they start manda- mandating that, right? Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, we've never experienced delinquencies like this. There's groups trying to delay evictions, but I feel that the only way the message will be communicated to tenants that they have to pay rent is by filing evictions, right? Yeah. So people have just basically stopped paying rent. Um, like Joe said, uh, because they just they that's the mindset now and that you know I don't have to pay rent uh, he, in fact later on he goes on this article goes on to say quote they feel like they don't have to pay rent anymore he said they've adjusted their lifestyles accordingly buying cars clothes whatever it is just not paying rent oh my goodness um, so that that's part of it and then the other part regarding the courts by the way everybody who's listening you're very welcome I had to go to bloomberglaw.com, sign up for like this free thing. Yeah. And then I got a call from an attorney <laughs> this morning on, on the way to work. And I, he says, hey, I see you signed up for Bloomberg Law. And I go, 
yeah, I just wanted the free article. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, to give me the author's name, I'll give you the article. So sure enough, they gave us the article. Uh, so this is from Bloomberg Law. Same day, again, August 18th. This is kind of all happening in real time. Pretty amazing. Yeah. State and local courts now lead effort to curb rise, rising evictions. Uh, the U.S. affordable housing crisis has not spared the land of enchantment. So now this is over in um, Albuquerque, New Albuquerque, Mexico. right? Rents are skyrocketing in Albuquerque, New Mexico's largest city, rising nearly 40% since March 2020, according to the apartment list. That's so much money. In, a, in nearby Santa Fe, the average apartment bedroom goes for 1400 a comparable to rents in larger and more exclusive metros. New Mexico's eviction moratorium expired in April, mm. allowing landlords to force out tenants who can't keep up with rising costs. Um, so, uh, but the state Supreme Court in New Mexico is not, not a mayor or state senator or governor, but the judiciary is working to curb evictions across the state. Since the start of the pandemic, the court has moved to protect vulnerable tenants and more recently to ensure displacement doesn't return to high levels seen across the state, uh, before a pandemic rent protections arrived to keep landlords from flooding courthouses. Once the ban was lifted in February, the New Mexico state Supreme Court launched an eviction diversion program an effort to bring landlords and tenants together to resolve their disputes and connect renters with resources. Um, so uh, basically, so back to you, Al, on, on this whole yeah. thing. I mean, so, it seems like he's a little bit above the head of the curve there, head of the curve about these judges doing this. But if his predictions and curve are right, big trouble ahead. Yep. I, I, I think, it, again, it's a combo punch to the economy and we're seeing some of the blows. I think a, a, a inflation, inflation was like a really tough jab, like that yeah. almost broke your nose. Right. But yeah. you're, but you're still wobbling. This is the second jab. I don't think it hits as hard, but like it maybe dazes you a little bit. Um, <clears throat> here's either a punch or a kick. I just learned. I thought this was over. I just learned that um, the moratorium on paying back your student loans is oh. still in effect. Oh, really? Still See, in effect. there's all these things that we forgot about. So all of a sudden you have, let's just say, uh, the lower income brackets being affected by everything that you went over. Every income bracket being affected by inflation. Yep. Now you have the middle income brackets. And I think you're pulling up the CBS News article. Yep. Um, and apparently it's supposed to end September 1st, which is two weeks away. And holy cow, the government and news has been extremely hush hush on this, <laughs> extremely hush hush. <laughs> and the news article is that one student loan provider said that in two weeks, we'll start deducting your uh, payment. Yeah. And then they had to renege on that and say no. And why it's kind of weird is because one person in our firm said like, apparently there's a rule or a law that. They have to let you know in advance when they're going to start collecting. And they haven't sent these out. And the one that was sent out then got squashed. So now think, if you have any student loans, I'm going to predict that it's probably 10% of your income. Like, I, I'm just gonna, it's probably more than that. Because student loan repayments can be anywhere from like $200 to like $2,000 yeah, a month. A mortgage. Yep. Yeah. $200 to $2,000. Yeah. And what I'm getting at is that I don't, let's just say 50%. I think that's generous. Didn't increase their spending habits whatsoever and save that money. Maybe they put it in something and got some interest and now are in a good position. The rest of the 50% might have increased their spending and you can buy more clothes. You can go cars, out more cars, all, all things the stuff like that, that yeah. right? Or maybe they didn't increase their spending, but inflation hit. So all of a sudden, what was in their budget is no longer in their budget. And if you think about the middle class and, and how much a proportion of uh, the economy they are, the majority, and all of a sudden they're going to have a $10 hit in money that's going to come right out of the system, out of stocks, out of unless they were literally putting it in their bank account, which then why not just pay it off, right? Well, like why not just send it, right? Um it's going to come out of stocks. It's going to come out the restaurant markets, closing market, and go into these loans. It's going to be a huge hit. And if anyone says, "Hey, that's an argument for, uh, for just a you know like forgiving these loans," no, that just increases inflation. And it's it's extremely classic class is in the sense of what about all the trades who didn't do this, and now you're giving free ten, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars to these people to 
you know, like me and you used to have student loans that made these decisions. Where's, where's all the, where's all their 10, 20, $40,000. Like this is, and, and if you're not just printing it, which will lead to inflation, then you're getting it through taxes. So you're literally taking money from someone financially responsible that maybe doesn't have the most, uh, high paying job and giving it to someone that does have a high paying job. Yeah. This is, it is, that is crazy. There's a, there's a, the, the parallel is, uh, just reminded me of like, so I like your connection about the, well, what did they do with the money that was deferred basically that they had to pay back either the renters or the student loan borrowers, right? They did something with it. Maybe they did invest it in the stock market, but then doesn't that lead to a semi crash if they got to sell it all off now? There you go. So there's got to be some kind of consequence, but like, Let's say, uh, yeah, so th- then, it, then it all ties back to what I'm getting at is like there's a parallel here to the 1929 stock market crash, which led to the Great Depression, is people had, people, the, the Federal Reserve you printed all, it gave, there was all this extra money and liquid in the market, right? And then all of a sudden the bank said, hey, we, you gotta, we're going to call you on that money. Yeah. And, they were, and people were investing. They only had to do like a 10% down on to buy a stock, basically. Oh, and so nice. it was this giant house of cards. So it's the same. It's the same thing in the sense of like the what the point is, the payments are coming due on multiple things very quickly here as we enter quarter four, September, and yeah. and what happens is what did you say before we started the podcast? History, history, not it only rhymes, rhymes and repeats. but doesn't repeat. It doesn't necessarily rhymes. repeat, but it rhymes. There you go. So be careful. Save your cash if you are a firm owner. Um, as much as you can try to be multi-pronged in your approach, go to architectsguide2.com, become a builder, diversify. Why that's so important is because if you have a shovel ready project, like Al was saying, or it's fully funded by the bank or a, 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 a homeowner who can actually pay cash for the whole thing, think about how much longer you extend the life of your firm for that year to two year downturn, whatever is coming up, because we're just at the we're just tipping our toes in this recession right now. Absolutely. Be careful. Uh, we have a we have a read from Nick, but I tell you what, Nick, we're going to save that for next episode because we got to hit Air Jeopardy real quick. Bring down the team. I am going question number one, and let's see at least your answer too. Um, what is the minimum bearing length of wood beams that are designed to bear on concrete? Is it A, one and a half inch, B, two inch, three, C, three inch, D, 4.5 inch? B, B, C, it is C, three inches. Nice. Question number two. What chapter of the IBC can you find the fastening schedule for wood connections? Mm, I know. A, chapter two, B, chapter six. C, chapter three, D, chapter four. I want to see if you really know. Okay, here, write it down. A, two, two, B, six, C, three, D, four. It's facing me. What do we got? It is chapter six, which is B. Dang it. I'm terrible. <laughs> Actually, it's facing you. Ha <laughs> 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 Number three, which of the following is actually included in a construction budget? Again, which of the following is actually included in a construction budget? Is it A, financing costs, B, cost of land, C, tap fees, D, professional design services? C and B, correct answer, C. Great job, Jason. Number four, which of the following land patterns is not one that was developed due to urban growth? Again, which of the following land patterns is not one that was developed due to urban growth? Is it A, concentric pattern, B, urban pattern, C, sector pattern, D, multiple nuclei pattern? That's the only thing we should ever design. Multiple, multiple nuclei? nuclei patterns. Yeah, Elon like, would doing. like it. Well, I don't know why Elon would like it, but he would. Uh, C, C, the correct answer actually is B, urban pattern. Tricking you. All right, take us out. If you like this episode, uh, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes. If you're watching on YouTube, please like, subscribe, leave us a positive comment. We'll see you next week.